So I'm Jamie Curtis from Youth Solutions, and I'm here with Melissa. Melissa. So what we're kind of going to do right now is kind of, uh, this. What I would like to do is kind of go back to your beginnings, you know, childhood kind of stuff, and how you were raised, and kind of like bring it to where we are right now, and then where you plan on going later on, you know, okay. from from this point forward. Um, how old are you, Melissa? You say Melissa, right? Yep. How old are you, Melissa? 37. 37. Mm -hmm. um, so growing up in a household, um, I don't know if you had siblings, two-parent household. How was it for you? I grew um, up in a single mom household with one older sub sibling. Um, she actually lived from sixth grade to high school graduation with my aunt and uncle. So it was kind of an interesting setting but single mom all the way my dad was a military guy and divorced my mom at one and my sister and i had different fathers she never met hers and she actually just passed away a couple of years ago um, from a pulmonary embolism and so yeah she moved back in when we were she was 18 but growing up you know, my mom struggled, worked many a jobs to put a roof over her head and feed us. And that left a lot of leniency and room for me to take advantage of the house. Mm -hmm. So at a young age, I was starting to have people over. And what, what age do you say when you say young age? Probably starting around like middle school, I would have okay. people over just to hang out. And I wasn't starting to like drink or anything like that. We were just, mm -hmm. you know, doing silly stuff, like sometimes getting in trouble with the neighbors or whatnot. And um, by 15, we were smoking weed and having people over to drink, and from there, just getting out of control. So, if you back it up a little bit, so you said you, it was a single family so your mom so she didn't have any boyfriends that were or anything like that just no. you and her and your sister growing up i only remember her dating one guy okay. and only once ever going to his house because she didn't want to put me in a situation okay. all right so when, when was the first time uh or what how old were you the first time you had you know a drink or whatever drug of choice well, actually, the first time I had a drink was probably, actually, the first, first time I had a drink was when I was in, I want to say third grade, and um, that was because we had a pool party. We lived in Pennsylvania mm -hmm. at the time, and I was refilling the adults' drinks, mm -hmm. but really, like, taking the drink and okay. drinking it, you know, and she was just mortified because I was drunk. You know? So it was, like, around eight? Yeah, something okay. like that. And I like, fell into the pool Ooh. and, you know, all sorts of stuff. I was, like, rolling around in the back of the wow. station when I did <laughs> Yeah, okay. it was a whole thing. Okay. And then um, the first time I started drinking was around 13. Okay. And she caught me, and she was like, you're drunk. And I tried to deny it, fell into... What, like, I, did you, I mean, what happened when you started drinking? Is you by yourself with some friends? Or? Um, I was with friends at 13. Okay. And we were drinking Mad Dog 2020. Ooh. Mad Dog 20, yeah, yeah, so mm. you're familiar. Um, and she caught me, like I said, and I tried to deny it, but then I fell into our wall heater and burnt the entire backside of me. Oh, wow. And she was like, I'm going to let that be your punishment this time, you know? And so I just tried to get better at hiding it from her. Mm. And after a while, you know, she knew what was going so on. So you saying you tried to get better at hiding it from her. So how often you know, were you doing it? At 13, I'm saying. At 13, I was probably doing it on the weekends only. And as I got older, it started to become some weeknights, definitely weekends. Mm -hmm. And then it progressed to sometimes we'd go to school with a drink. Sometimes we'd go to school high on acid. You know, we. So did. when was the first time you crossed and did something outside of alcohol? Could you speak about something else? Weed. Um, 
was 15. 15, okay. Mm -hmm. And I had this random, like, I don't know, date set that I wasn't going to do anything else until I was 16. Mm. And I wasn't going to smoke weed, I wasn't going to lose my virginity, I wasn't going to do anything mm -hmm. until I was 16. And then a month before I turned 16, I started doing everything. And um, I don't know why. When you say everything, what do you mean? Smoking weed, losing my virginity, trying acid. And I hung with an older crew, so that's part of why, you know. But, um, yeah, we would go to school, high on all of those things, with a drink. And, I mean, one time my friend and I found an inhaler in the gym and made him, a, like, a time to meet in the bathroom and mm -hmm. try to get high off the inhaler. That's, we were just, like, willing to try anything, okay. you know, to get high. So, this is 16. Yeah, this is about sixteen. I'm in high school at this point. In high school, sixteen, mm -hmm. and you. How 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 much of the other drugs were you doing? Because it's a little expensive to get the stuff that you're talking about. Then. Right. Well, we we were I was daily smoker. Okay. Um, acid got pretty bad. Uh, we were doing it almost every day, mm -hmm. and when you say got pretty bad, what what was the impact from it? After effects, I guess. Um, or how did it impact your life at 16? Well, the fact that I was like going to school high on acid mm. and not taking my schooling seriously. Mm. I mean, also with the weed, it's like I was late to school every single day sure. because I would roll around and smoke a blunt first. And mm. my dean of girls like absolutely despised me because she knew that she was never getting a real letter from my mom. It was me. Okay. And she had it out for me my whole high school life and ended up suspending me um, three months from high school graduation wow. or, or expelling me, actually. Mm -hmm. So I had to get my GED, but all my teachers like rallied around me and they got me my diploma anyway. So really didn't learn anything from that lesson because I basically still got my diploma and just got three months off school. So, I'm like, yeah. so was it <laughs> so you saying that right there? Was that kind of like your life up to that point? Kind of getting what I wanted. Yeah. Yeah. Being kind mm -hmm. of being enabled in a sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. That that's just what I'm starting to hear. And he's 16, so. Yeah. Go ahead. And even like when I was high on acid at school, once my science teacher knew, mm -hmm. I could tell because I was like tripping out on some boy's shoes, and he like comes over and he just started messing with me and thought it was funny, mm -hmm. you know. Okay. So it was just. Because I had like a good outgoing personality, it was very nice and mm -hmm. well behaved for the most part, except for doing the drugs. Okay. And so I think a lot of that had to do with it, you know. Right. Right. And then even in my adult life, for the most part, I kind of got my way. Okay, so after 16, you got your diploma. Mm -hmm. You so you said you was from Pennsylvania. No, I'm born and raised Hampton, Virginia. We lived in Pennsylvania for a couple of years. Okay, all right. So mm -hmm. basically, you grew up here mm -hmm. the entire time. Yeah. Okay, so what? what no, I don't go to national high school. But um, so you, you are out of high school. Now, what does it look like? Um, two months after my high school graduation, I moved to California mm -hmm. because my dad always told me, you know, if you want to move to California, I'll pay for your college and help you along. So I moved in with him and into a place called Antioch, California, which I flew in at night to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, wow, well, California. And then I woke up in Antioch, and I was like, what is this place? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it so was just, was it just you and your dad? It was my dad and I living together, yeah. But my grandma lived across or town, and so did my aunt. So okay. they were all pretty close, okay. and my uncle. And... Um, it was hard because my dad had never lived with me before. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I'm an 18 year old girl and he's like, you need to be home at 11. I was like, I haven't been home at 11 since I was 11. Right. You know, <laughs> I'm like, I don't think so. And um, so I just started doing my thing, you know. And Were you allowed to? Or did it bring some conflict inside your home between you and your dad? Um, for the most part, he just let it go, you know. And he just, yeah, really let it go. 
And he saw some crazy stuff. Like I once left a bong on the kitchen sink and he said, oh, there's far worse things in life than smoking a little grass. And at that time I wasn't drinking very much anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I was kind of feeling over it. So I was just smoking weed, but I was working hard. I worked three jobs and I went to school full time. Okay. One was an internship at a radio station because I knew I wanted to work in the music industry. And my music law professor was like, saw something in me and got me the internship almost immediately. So life was just working out, you know? Mm. And then from there, I got my first real like marketing job because I realized I didn't want to work in radio after all because it was all computer based. Mm -hmm. And next thing you know, I'm able to get into all these shows for free. People knew me around town. And, and he's still in California. Mm -hmm. Okay. I lived in California until like 2016 okay. and in like the San Francisco, Oakland area and worked in music the whole time. I had a really, really good, you know, reputation for my work. I worked with music festivals, bands, international companies. Um, and then, you know, at some point I had gotten diagnosed with ulcerative colitis in my early 20s and I handled it pretty well but then you know I started getting pain meds and stuff mm -hmm. and still worked through it still kept myself professional and then it would get worse and worse because I would drink socially with you would be what is supposed to be drinking yeah right. I would I shouldn't have been drinking right. at all right. you know and I would drink socially when I would go out to a show or a festival and you know, I'd just be like, oh, I'm fine. Or I would read something. You know how you can read any, like, find an answer to anything you want? Absolutely. And, like, yeah. I'd find, like, oh, you can drink clear tequila, and it won't hurt your ulcerative colitis. So I'd be like, tequila, you know? Yeah. And, you know, next thing you know, I'm mixing these pills and drinking. I'm starting to make them full of myself. And then I'm taking more pills than I needed because I wanted them. Mm -hmm. And before I know it, I'm an addict. Mm -hmm. And so I. So when, when, when would you officially say that you admitted to yourself that you were an addict? Probably about 25. 25? Yeah. What, what made you. What, what brought you to that right there? Well. Take that thought. I kept being prescribed pain meds and I would go through them really quickly. Mm hmm. And my boyfriend at the time, he didn't do anything like that. Okay. He kept his, he was in a band, kept his drinking really like under control, you know. He just was really balanced and level headed. And so I kind of asked him to keep an eye on me, like, you know, ask me if I need it. And he would. And then I started finding that to be annoying. And so I would drink and take the pills and then I would be like making a fool of myself and embarrassing him backstage, you know, because I was a representative of the band because I would work with his band and I was his girlfriend. Okay. And um, so I went to my doctor and I said, you know, I feel like I'm taking these because I want them, not because I need them. Mm -hmm. And his solution was to, and I keep using them before it's time and his solution was to give me more so I wouldn't run out as quickly Wow. yeah and so I reached out for help you know because I, I realized asking my boyfriend put too much pressure on him and it made me feel like he was being my dad or something okay. and so I reached out professionally and got the wrong response and of course I took them because I wanted them at that point mm -hmm. so and you had already recognized that Mm -hmm. Yeah. That it wasn't fulfilling the need of what it was supposed to kill. Yeah. Versus you just want, you know, because of the feeling. That it well, was I think, like, I guess when he prescribed more of them, I was like, well, maybe I do need them. I don't know. You know, mm -hmm. I was, like, conflicted. And now I realize I took them because I wanted them. Okay. I could have said no. Right, right, right. But I didn't, okay. you know? And then... um Slowly, you know, it increased. My doctor went, left the practice, and the next doctor saw that I had said that, cut me off right away. 
And so, so they documented that you mm -hmm, that you I had said that. that. Okay. Yeah. And so I go to the street to a friend and say, you know, I need to get some pills. So I start getting 30 milligram oxycodones instead of five milligram oxycodones. Mm -hmm. And big uh, difference. Yeah, big yeah. difference. Yeah. And I start abusing those. Mm -hmm. And then um, I come to visit here for a concert with a friend of mine, a couple friends of mine, and we had brought our pills along. Mm -hmm. And of course I used all mine and he used all his. And mm -hmm. we tried to find um, more because he was going to fly home and he was going to be sick if he didn't get any. Mm -hmm. So we were looking, looking, looking. We could only find a few Percocet. So I was like, you can have these. I'll keep looking because I wasn't leaving yet. And uh, I had a friend that said, well, I can find heroin. It's the same thing. Mm. And I said, all right, I guess I'll try it, you know? And I mm. took a bump of heroin and never went back. Mm. And What was that like, that first time? It was like the same feeling, but better mm. and way cheaper. Yes. And I mean, I snorted it. I never shot it up or anything. So, and I'm very thankful I never did that because, you know, people always say it's even harder to get off of it if you do that. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's hard enough as it as it is, you right, know. Right, right. And um, mm -hmm. so, right in that moment, how old were you uh, when you switched to all head for the first time? Uh, about twenty. Seven. Okay. Yeah, thirty. Oh, twenty-seven or twenty-eight. Oh, now, I wasn't thirty yet. Or maybe right. I was. Yeah, I was probably about tw twenty-seven. Um. Okay, so in, in some way in between there, twenty-seven, yeah. thirty years old. Yeah. Okay, so from that point forward, it's coming forward. Then what? Um, you know, that just got out of control. I was like, my tolerance would build up. Then I would be like, I need to stop this. Like, it's just gotta go. And I so would you know, was trying to stop from the home? Mm hmm. Or I'd get on Suboxone and then I would just stop going for one reason or the other. My insurance would stop covering it or I would not have enough money to go to the Suboxone doctor. And I would try to like, you know, make them last and think, oh, well, I'll be fine. And then something would happen and I would just be like, ah, oh, I want to get high, you know. Okay. And then uh, my sister passed away and that really like broke me. And I started using again and drinking. So that was a good reason to start that using. To me. To, I mean, no, to yeah. numb yourself. And yeah. To not feel what you supposed to feel, the normal grief process and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, you know, it definitely, it would help in the moment, but I'd wake up mm -hmm. in pain and everything was still there. All my problems were still there. Mm -hmm. And so I slowed down on using, and but I ramped up my drinking. Mm -hmm. And so, because it helps with opiate withdrawals, supposedly, and I was just drinking like a fish, and I was just like, this is worse. It's mm -hmm. killing me. I have liver failure now because of using and drinking, mm -hmm. and I need a liver transplant at 37, you know? And um, so basically, I just... One day after making a complete fool of myself in a 7-Eleven, my mom couldn't get me out of the store. She had to call my auntie mom to help physically remove me from the store, talk the cashier out of calling the police on me, etc. Um, I woke up the next morning and all I could remember from the interaction was staring at them with hate. Mm -hmm. Like, just like gritting on them from pushing me into the car, you know? And I felt so bad. And so that day I was like, okay, I'm not going to drink today. You know, I was like, I'm going to try not to drink today. But then I was starting to go through withdrawal and I had my mom take me out for a drive. So like just to get out of the house, cause I was feeling anxiety and stuff. And 
she wouldn't stop. And I was like, you know what? I think I need to go to the hospital. So I go to the hospital and I say to the doctor, I have a liver thing. And he says, you don't have a liver thing. You have liver failure and you're going to die if you don't stop drinking. What's, what's the thing you claim now? It's not this program. No, it's my desire to want to be clean, number one. It's I want it. Okay. You know, I'm, t I'm done. It's like I had such a charmed life for so long and then I just threw it away for drugs and alcohol. Even that relationship that I was talking about, like, mm. that was the best relationship I've ever been in. Mm. And I just chose my addiction over that. Mm. Like, I pretty much ruined that unconsciously or subconsciously, like, on purpose because I was choosing addiction. Mm -hmm. You know? And... Um, Fear and success. Huh? Fear of success. Too. Yeah. Yeah, it's like I felt maybe I didn't deserve it because I was hiding this gorilla on my back, you know? And, you know, because he didn't know the extent of how bad I was getting, you know? Mm -hmm. And, I mean, he did see it. We went to Paris, and, like, I took so many pills, I was falling asleep during this, like, fabulous dinner that he mm -hmm. took me to, you know? And so I just had to end it. And I regret it, but, you know, that's life. I'll find mm -hmm. love once I like work on myself and over time, you know, but, um, I just, it's me, then it's my family and my health. You have a sponsor? I had picked a temporary sponsor, but they're not the right person for me. They're like, what, what is the right sponsor for you? Someone that doesn't say, if I'm not available, I'll make appointment to talk to you. Or like when I say I have a burning desire and I say, well, next time I'll pick up the phone to call you. And they say, or just get busy, you mm -hmm. know, stuff like that. Like someone that will make time for me when I need to talk. Right. You, you know? go to meetings? Um, I go to meetings Tuesday and Thursday with the okay. group here. And I need to get more active on doing Zoom meetings. And Safe Harbor Crew, we've set up our own meeting on Saturday nights. Okay. So, all right, because um, you know this this hearing your story uh, a lot from the story that you didn't carry. You may it seemed like you've been enabled like your entire life almost, you know, to do the things you did, and and life wasn't really serious. Um, you 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 was caught near this big giant seeing this. I don't know, but mm -hmm. it seemed like you had like this big giant safety net underneath you. You never really have to worry about anything. And the one time I looked at your face, the second time the doctor said to you, hmm, you know, you're gonna die. You know, uh, that that and also the loss of your so boyfriend. No. Oh boy. you no, know, your boyfriend. Damn. I understand by what I see. Yeah. You know, that that was, you know, you realize, you know, because you look back I think just now mm -hmm. when you were talking about that. And, and you realize that, that was that was that opportunity that you had, you know. And, and, and I don't I don't know what it was like, but you know, you felt love, mm -hmm. you know, in that in, in, by him. Um, when it comes back, you know, sure will, you know. But loving yourself, like you said, mm -hmm. you know, that's when you love yourself. You, then you allow others to love you, and uh, nobody can carry your happiness. You know, you have your own. So, and it can't be false. So, and, and, and one of the things when I asked you as far as you know, being here, because, you know, you can walk out the door right now and just go, go drink. Mm -hmm. You know, that's it. So I'm glad that you said what you said as far as, you know, it's because it's your desire, because that's, that's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. No matter what we think or say or whatever, I mean, it's outside looking in. It has absolutely nothing to do with the outside. Because mm -mm. all your changes are inside of you. When you ready, that's when it's going to happen. Yeah. And up until that moment, it, it's just not going to happen for you. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that, you know, it's, I don't know if, if I, I, I don't have a choice but blame my cup says believe me. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a choice but to believe you. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you're not at those. That's a part of um, addict's behavior is to manipulate 
So it's almost like a little kid story here in the world, you know, the, mm-hmm. because it, that's, that's that survival thing, or mm-hmm. it's a whole lifetime of hiding stuff. Mm-hmm. You get good at it, even mm-hmm. from yourself. Yeah. Not being honest with yourself, yeah. Absolutely. Not being honest, you know, looking at the reality, of what I can see 37 now, mm-hmm. and, and I, I'm assuming that you're in the process of maybe um, getting a surgery when it can come to you. Right, yeah. You know, so that right there in itself is, that's life and death. Yeah. You know, so with you, like I say to everybody, what will help you, what will shift things, what will turn the whole world around, is it's not picking up. Mm-hmm. Simple as that. Yeah. Because if you don't, I mean, really, I mean, if you really look at the simplicity of it, if you don't, what happens? I saved my life. Things start healing. Mm-hmm. I mean, everything just start rejuvenating. It, it start as long as it's not being fed anymore. Mm-hmm. I mean, even as simple as like my whole my eyes were yellow. I was jaundiced, you know. Mm-hmm. And like now, you look at me, my eyes are white. I'm not yellow anymore, mm-hmm. you know. And it's like so. I know that there's healing going on in my body, mm-hmm. you know. So it's like. Who knows where I'll be in six months? Who knows? You know? So your gratitude is where? Huh? Your gratitude. Where is it? My gratitude? Oh, it's all over the place, honestly. Um, to uh, my higher power. I believe in God now. I always, like, kind of did, but questioned it. Mm-hmm. Um, definitely to these treatment programs. To myself for finally getting it. Mm-hmm. To my family for supporting me in this decision. Um, and yeah, I mean, I guess that's like the main places right now. Okay. Right. One thing I didn't ask, and I think I would hope that you would have mentioned it if, if you do have any. Do you have any kids? No. Okay. So, I'm going to say, we go all this time. Yeah. Say, yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> I so mean, I did right. not yeah. mention the fact that, like, um, I was taking care of my niece and nephews okay. and they are very important to me. They're the closest things to kids that I have, mm-hmm. but that was, you know, like I was present for them, but around them, I would still drink and mm-hmm. stuff, you know, not like right in front of them, but like, you know, when they were in the other room or whatever, I would do my thing and they knew I drank because their dad drank. So like I felt comfortable drinking in front of them. Because they saw it with dad anyway, you know. So you and your mom have a pretty close relationship. We do. Mm -hmm. So what kind of daughter are you to your mom? Through her eyes. Um, Through her eyes. Through her eyes. Yeah, not from where you are. A loving daughter who thinks I know it all and talks down to her. But is trying my hardest and has been struggling with addiction. Is that the truth? Hmm? Is that the truth? Mm-hmm. Through her eyes. That's yeah. what you believe? I do. Yeah. Okay. All right. So what part will you change? Um, well, what you just said. I have definitely grown more gratitude for her because I look at what she's done for me and like how she's actually trying to help me mm-hmm. and not enabling me, you know, mm-hmm. like, She's actually wanted me to get help for so long, but, you know, she knew I wouldn't do it unless I was ready, you know, because she also knows not only is that true for every addict, but my personality, I'm going to be like, "Uh uh-uh, you know, and be nicer to her. Just let her know I love her so much all the time because I'm not promised tomorrow and Mm -hmm. with anybody. And I know that now, especially after losing my sister. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm going to leave you with this last thing, um, as in uh, that, well, nine-year-old, I would say 13-year-old. Don't allow that same little kid, I, I, I say this to a lot of people, to make decisions in your adult life. Mm-hmm. You know, because it's all connected. You know, right. In that first time all the tea sitting inside of this chair. Um, so, and sometimes, you know, we still allow that 
look spoiled little girl mm-hmm. and got away with stuff right to make decisions and not adult like and it don't match mm-hmm. it don't work anymore you know, right you can't use that same stuff mm-hmm. in your adult world and at work it, it don't you know what I mean almost like saying um for you to go find an outfit that you had on when you was nine what right that, what did it look like right <laughs> <laughs> so, like it so same thing with the behavior Right. You know, so you can't wear that same behavior. Yeah. Or you can't have that same train of thought. You, you know, right. Yeah. As you grow, it's supposed to evolve. You're supposed to, you know. Yeah. But sometimes it don't happen. Yeah. And, 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 and you do um, have a disease, mm-hmm. but you're not a disease. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So accepting the disease aspect of it, I mean, what do you do with a person that has a disease? You do the things that's going to treat the disease and right. work on it yeah and, and the crazy part with an addict how you treat that disease is to not feed it right that's the simplicity of it and, yeah. and, and and clarity will come to you and you'll be okay yeah. you might be searching this now. anyway Thank appreciate you. you uh yeah. being honest and candid yeah. in this conversation and um, definitely honest <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, Well, thank you. I appreciate it.